For me, I'm very driven by achievement uh, and experiences. And uh, it's never really been the accolades or other things that have really motivated me. It's always I've always had this strong desire to just achieve against a set of goals I set for myself when I was 14 years old. I still have that list. And I still look at it every year. And my new goals for the year are all about advancing that list that I started when I was, you know, and I've added to that list, obviously. But it's amazing how my life has been largely driven by a list I put together when I was 14 years old. Welcome to Seeking Excellence. I'm Brett Pinniger. In my work, I help executives and teams become their best and enjoy the remarkable results that striving for excellence enables. You can learn more about my coaching, peer groups, training programs, and consulting services at brettpinniger.com. You can also follow me on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram at Brett Pinniger. Check the show notes for all the specifics. The Seeking Excellence podcast is all about helping us understand what makes leaders that are striving to be their best tick. What are their beliefs or mindsets about how the world works? What motivates them? And how do they bring their best to their work? And then we take those insights to uncover things we can all do, to live and lead with more intention. If you enjoyed this podcast, we would appreciate it if you take time to subscribe, rate, review, and share it with others. And if you've got suggestions for people you would like to see as guests, email us at seekingexcellence at brettpinniger.com. Now let me introduce my guest. David Bywater is the CEO at Vivint Solar, a leading full-service residential solar integrator. Prior to joining Vivint Solar, David served as COO at Vivint Smart Home and was an executive vice president at Xerox. Earlier in his career, David was a consultant with Bain & Company and the Monitor Group. In our discussion, David shares his thoughts on how to make failure positive, the importance of, of a plan and maintaining momentum, helping ordinary people do extraordinary things, incentivizing your team members effectively, the upside and downside of data, bending light and running towards the fire, staying curious and questioning the status quo, and what happened when he was 14 years old that changed the course of his life. Let's dig in. David, it's great to be with you today. It's good to see you again, Brett. Wonder if we could start out talking a little bit about Vivint Solar. Tell me a little bit about the company. Great. So, um, you know, we are one of the largest solar companies in the United States. We do residential solar. Mm -hmm. We have about uh, 3,500 employees. We're in 21 states. Uh, we're public. We went uh, public on the New York Stock Exchange back in 2014. And so uh, that has been a fun venture for us as a company. Uh, we're also majority owned by Blackstone mm -hmm. um, out of New York City. Um, we do residential solar. Uh, we have about 120,000 customers at this point. We've raised over $3 billion. Uh, and we do basically everything from financing up front. Last year, we raised about $1.2 in financing. Mm -hmm. We do all the sales, all the installation, all the servicing. And so it's a, a fully integrated solar company. We're trying to bring green energy to the world. Fantastic. Tell me a little bit about just the, the relationship between Vivint and Vivint Solar. I know so they're sister companies. Uh, Vivint Solar uh, what began within Vivint mm -hmm. Smart Home. And uh, it was this novel idea saying, hey, there's common capabilities and uh, a common culture. You know, there's this opportunity that uh, we might want to go chase. And so they started in 2011, mm -hmm. I believe. And uh, by 2000. And 13, it had developed a pretty good little team and was kind of on its own. And then, uh, and then they did the IPO in uh, October of 2014. And at that point, it, it you know sp spun out, had its own capital structure, its own management team, its own board, and um, and its own premise. Uh, it's on its Fantastic. own now and, and doing pretty well. But they're still they're you know very closely related. Um, we collaborate on some joint sales and. Uh, there's still a lot of common DNA between the two groups and uh, a lot of respect, and, and we, we enjoy each other's company. Fantastic. Talk a little bit about your first introductions to leadership. <clears throat> what were your first leadership experiences that were meaningful to you in terms of your present-day leadership? Well, you know, I think you're right. It, you know, you go back and you, you learn a lot of your leadership by observation. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I've always considered myself really fortunate because I've had great mentors. 
I mean, from the first days, Steve Delano at Monitor mm-hmm. uh, just uh, was the perfect manager when I first started consulting years ago back in Boston where we met. And Steve taught me a lot about um, – he taught me a lot about failure, to be honest with you. Mm. Um, and probably one of the greatest lessons I've learned in leadership is that failure is a really good tool. It's a it's a great teaching tool. And to not be afraid of it. I think growing up, I was always afraid to fail. And as a result, you really were not taking the risks that you should have taken. Um, mm. You played it safe. And yeah. I think all the way through, uh, through college, I was playing it safe. And then I realized uh, when I first started to work out in Boston that if I wasn't failing 20 or 30% of the time, then I was failing by definition because I wasn't pushing myself hard mm-hmm. enough. And I think early on, Steve Delano helped me realize that um, I didn't have to be perfect. Uh, no matter what, he was able to help you know, enlarge my thinking, how I viewed the world and give me feedback. And I started to seek out feedback and realize, push myself. And as long as I'm winning more than I'm losing, right. I'm winning. So I think that was really formative for me. And then I've had a lot of other really good mentors uh, throughout the years. And as you watch them um, and how they lead both good and bad. You learn a lot. Um, but that first time you get the opportunity to lead, um, it can be a pretty humbling experience. <laughs> Absolutely. Failure. I'd love to talk about that some more because that's, that's so central to what I see as the core of great leadership. And yet it's something that we often don't talk about. Yeah. We don't talk about our failures. People will look at you and say, has David Bywater ever failed? Yeah. And they'll go, nah, he's always been successful. Look at this, look at this, look at this. And yet your success they, is yeah. built upon those failures. Oh, absolutely. I mean, talk a little bit about maybe an experience you're willing to share where you had a failure and what came from that. Well, you know, I think that you have a lot. Um, you know, every day uh, there are failures every day. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, for us as a company, you know, we're always trying to push into new markets um, with new leaders. Um, we're trying to try out new solutions that are lower cost, a better service. I mean, I can't tell you the number of failures we've had. It's the mindset of, you know, you just got to fail fast. Mm-hmm. You got to fail forward, mm-hmm. right? And, um, you know, that's the concept we always use as a company is just fail forward. Just make sure that you've learned quickly, you've adjusted, and that you're moving forward um, in a very, very quick way. I remember, you know, when we were at uh, Viv and Smart Home, uh, that was a, a change from being kind of a security company into a smart home company. And I was the chief operating officer uh, for them at the time. And, uh, you know, we had to think about uh, moving into um, new products that uh, that help companies be, uh, customers be more sticky. Mm-hmm. Uh, they saw the value every day of what right. we brought. And, uh, you know, I remember we went into the doorbell camera. And that doorbell camera was a phenomenal new product. Um, and... Uh, But along with it, you know, you had to learn a lot about Wi-Fi and, you know, communication failures and customer service because they're having, you know, connectivity issues. And, you know, I I just remember we all said, you know, we'll fail as long as we can learn quickly. And it put a lot of strain on the organization to figure out how to service customers differently and install correctly. And you just couldn't, you know, we knew we couldn't not do it. We just had to charge into it, do the very best we could learn from our mistakes very quickly. And uh, it was all about the speed of adaptation um, that made the difference for us there. How do you build that into the culture? Because so often people naturally, <clears throat> like both of us, are afraid of failure and yeah. or are afraid of exposing themselves in that way. Yeah. What do you do culturally to create a, an, an environment where that's not only understood, but uh, sort of valued as long as you're failing forward? Well, I think it's, it's got to start from the tone from the top. Um, you got to talk about it. Um, you have to let people know that uh, you're, we're, you know, we're after full potential. You know, we're, we're trying to, w- w- whether it's a, at an individual level uh, or at a company level, you know, you're trying to say what is the very best that you or we can do, mm-hmm. right? And when you define that and you say, you know, it's it's this size, it's this market cap, it's this type of market share, it's this type of customer experience, it's this type of uh, just momentum, you know, mm-hmm. defining what success sure. is. Um, and then you say anything short of that, guys, we're, you know, we're not achieving our full potential. So that is what our success is. And um, and and letting people, you know, they, they just get a feeling from you, which is, you, you kind of know if you have the right tone, because People will come to you and they'll ask for, you know, your blessings Mm -hmm. or even better, they'll just do it. 
And they'll still do it within the confines of, I still got to hit my numbers. Mm -hmm. I still got to respect the budget. But they find ways to fund their innovation. And I think that's when you know you're succeeding. Um, when people, uh, like for instance, I, you know, right now at uh, Vivint Solar, I, I absolutely love, I do frontline Fridays. Mm -hmm. So on Fridays, I go out and I actually go do the job of our frontline employees, whether it's selling, whether it's installing, whether it's on the phone calls, you know, whatever it is, I, I try to go sit down for two hours every Friday. I don't always do it, but I try to do it as much as I can and do their job. You learn from them. And when, you, when you're with your employees and they're telling you about things that they've innovated, and you're like, wow, I had no idea. Yeah. And there's like this last year, we had innovation in HR about how they recruit and onboard. That I was like, this is fantastic. Um, we had uh, innovation in customer service on, you know, on how they uh, understand customer needs and how they prioritize and how they service them using data, right? And I had no idea. It's the same thing in our products and same thing in our in our sales and in our service. When you see and you learn about innovation after the fact, mm -hmm. you're like, okay, I think I have a culture of this. Right. And if you, and I think if you're if you're not seeing that, you should ask yourself, have I created a, a culture of fear to experiment? Mm -hmm. So I think it's probably a good good measuring stick. So separation between the success of the outcome versus the, the success of the process or the activity here. Because we can't control the outcome, typically. We can control the process and the activity here. How do you capture and help people be accountable for failing well from a process perspective or from an input perspective, an activity perspective? Because that's a different kind of failure. Yeah. You know, when I fail to meet an expectation of having done the work I was supposed to do versus having achieved the outcome maybe that we were looking for. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's exactly right. You know, all we can control is the inputs. We can't control the outputs. We try to influence them. Right. And we try to do the best we can. I, so, I mean, if, if the question is how do you make sure that people are going through the process? Right. Um, you know, I think stretch goals make a big difference for us. Um, you know, I think you've experienced it before where, you know, you get a budget and you're like, I don't know how I'm going to pull that off. Right. <laughs> you know, there are so many gaps of, okay, I think I could figure out 70% of that. But I don't know how to figure out the other, 70, the other 30%. And I think that that, that you know, how am I going to pull this off is actually healthy for us because it forces you to think differently. It forces you to approach problems differently. And, um, you know, whenever I uh, have given or have received kind of a comfortable target, I think innovation, for the most part, just goes out the it's window. Not, yeah. So I think that's why full potential is so important and setting those stretch goals. I, I, I've always told our teams, look, I'd rather set a stretch goal and have us achieve 90 or 80% of that. And my 90 or 80% is still far superior than what they would have done on their own, or probably 50% of that. So, you know, and then helping them understand that that actually was a success. Right. That a 90% success is a success it for is, the organization. It is a success right. because we're, we're still so much farther ahead. Um, and then I think they also got to realize that, you, you know, you're never satisfied because you never, ever reach it. Like you, you never reach full potential. Um, but it's the journey. I, I tell my people all the time, I don't care where you are right now. I want to know. I don't care where you are. Like, I'm not going to grade you on good, bad about where you are. But do you know where you are? Do you have a plan or where you want to get to? And do you have momentum? Great. Now, we'll debate whether or not the trajectory is steep enough or not, mm -hmm. but as long as they're showing, here's where I am, here's where I want to get to, and I have momentum, and you applaud that, I have been amazed over the years uh, at, the, at the, the percentage of people who will overachieve your own expectations for them. You know, the majority, you know, I, I learned years ago, the trick, the trick, the trick, the true genius of management is getting extraordinary results out of ordinary people. And most of us are ordinary. ordinary. Yep. Indeed, we all are. And, 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 and to me, how you do that is you help them define where they are, where they need to be, help percolate and support their efforts to figure out how to get there. But when they know that you have their back, right, when they know that you're supporting them and you're not going to criticize them when they fall down for the first time, mm -hmm. but you're going to pick them up and you're going to help them, I have found that 80% of the people will achieve a level of performance that far exceeds their expectations and yours. And 20% don't, but 80% of people, when you support them, will come very close or achieve what you 
hope they can achieve. Isn't that amazing? I mean, isn't it remarkable? And isn't for me, that's the joy of leadership. Yeah is seeing the success of other people here sure. where they exceed their own expectations it's, of what they want to do. There's nothing better. Yeah. I mean, that if you're in man, if you're leading, you know, I don't care what you are, if you're a principal of a, of a school, whether you're running a company, um, large or small, if you're in any kind of leadership position, um, if, if you don't get extreme joy out of seeing others achieve, then you're probably in the wrong profession. I mean, you should not be a leader. Like that, 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 that is a large, large contributor to, you know, why we do what we do, the stress we go through, the, the challenges we go through. It's because you see that that fulfillment at a personal level and at a collective level. How do you how do you how do you um, sort of reward, sort of celebrate, honor people that are success at Vivint Solar? What do you do to kind of help them see that? Well, uh, we do a lot of different things. I, I think. Um, Vivint Solar uh, really, you know, uh, on the sales side, they treat every employee as an athlete. And really, I mean, yeah. that's, that's, they, they play into that. They, they like to recruit, and we all think we're inner athletes at some point or were at some point, um, but we really play upon that. We have like, almost like a, like a sports center profile on every uh, salesperson, and they they see how they're doing their first sixty to ninety days on the job mm -hmm. compared to the greats, mm -hmm. and you can forecast out how well they'll do. And we have a thing called the league, mm -hmm. where you literally have different levels of performance. And you know, for a long time, we compared a salesperson against everyone. And we're like, wait, that's not, that's not very effective. Let's actually put them into their respective classes. Are you a true freshman? Um, are you a true senior? You know, kind of where are you in your maturity? And then let's compare you against that group. And we celebrate it. Every week we have podcasts. Um, we really call out exceptional performance. And, um, you know, just it's, it's, it's that unit of one of having them feel like they really are known that their results are tracked and transparent. And, you know, you, you celebrate their successes and you encourage them in their own direction, but you give them comparative economics, kind of how they're doing compared to other people. Like I said, people, when they see that and they feel like you're supporting them, most of them want to rise to the occasion or they'll leave. Right. That's, um, that's not the place for them. Not the place for them. And that's actually a success. Sure. Right? Having them go find something that, that they can be successful and then opening that spot up for somebody else um, is really healthy for an organization. Easy to be data driven in an incentive driven environment. We got sales yeah. or other incentive driven people. What about people that are not incentive driven or not traditionally incentive driven? You know, um, I think that's one of the great misnomers of business. I think we all can be. Mm. Um, and incentives, you know, can go the opposite direction. You got to be very careful. Sure. You know, I learned that years ago uh, when I left Bain, um, and I I'd been there for four years after business school, and I knew that I was like, can I, I can be a career consultant. Um, or I can go run companies. And I, and I always felt like I had to go run companies. Mm -hmm. I, I felt that's kind of where my strengths were. Mm -hmm. um, and I appreciated the investment banking and consulting, all that background, but I, I just always liked the human element of, of running stuff. And uh, so when I, when I first left Bain and uh, decided to go join this company called ACS, they uh, were big into piece rate. And um, what was interesting about that was you know, over my 10 years there, I, I ran a lot of companies for them, large consulting firms, uh, large, you know, uh, service companies. And there's just a whole, there was dozens and dozens and dozens of companies I learned, uh, I ran with them. And in almost every situation, you could go put in a comp plan mm -hmm. that rewarded both productivity and quality. Mm -hmm. And it didn't matter. It didn't matter if you were a HR consultant or if you were running a call center or if you're managing a big data center for Nike or Disney, right. you could always quantify something and get them to be more driven on performance and quality uh, in almost every situation. Not, not all of them, but most of them. As and, long as you got the data. And the gamification mm -hmm. of a job um, with the data and the transparency, most people enjoyed that. And... You know, I really think, especially in our culture today, the gamification of, of mundane tasks or less than mundane tasks uh, makes it more enjoyable. You seem to be a very data-driven leader here. The data is central to your ability to both manage the business and inspire other people here. Um, sometimes that's hard to come by, though. Sure. And, uh, and sometimes the data you come by isn't the real data here. Sure. What do you do as a leader to make sure that you're seeing things um, broadly and from all perspectives here so you don't get too sort of 
down the, the rails on one thing that may be misguiding you? Well, you know, data is great, but it also be dangerous. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember when I was at Bain, uh, I was joked. I would have 100 data points to make one decision. And then you go into business and you make 100 decisions off of one, one data, data point. point. And if you have two data points, you're like, fantastic. I can draw a line. Exactly. Um, and so you, you, you can never get too much data. Um, but you learn to figure out how to get enough data. Mm-hmm. And you still go with intuition and you still go with, I have to bend light. I got to figure out how to make this happen no matter what. So I, I just think with data, um, you know, I question things uh, a lot. And, you know, you know, we learned early in our careers to be hypothesis driven. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, the great thing about that approach to business is what data do I need? Um, versus what I'd like to have. Let me just figure out what I, what are the bare bones really go validate that data, make sure it's right. And then you've got to make a a decision. You've got to say, I have enough data and, you know, staying away from analysis paralysis is one of the key uh, requirements to be successful in, in any leadership role but also knowing what is the right and sufficient data. And I, you know, I'm, I'm sure like everyone that listens to this podcast, there are times where I've made decisions. I thought I had good data and I didn't, mm-hmm. um, or the data changed on me. Um, that happens. That's part of failure. Uh, and you just try to get the best data you can make the best decisions you can. And, uh, more importantly, own the results. Um, and, uh, you know, yeah, but I am a data dog. I, I'll never deny my roots. That's great. That's great. So there are a couple of things we've talked about so far that sort of are beginning to paint a picture for your leadership philosophy, your approach to leadership, maybe data, um, putting people first, um, you know, accountability, incentives, things like that here. Is there an overarching philosophy that you sort of subscribe your, to that would, uh, would identify who you are as a leader? Uh, well, maybe. Uh, there's some things that I really hold fast to. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll share uh, three of them. Um, I think the first one was I had a professor at uh, business school, Richard Tedlow, mm. and it was a business history class of all things. It wasn't entrepreneurialism. It wasn't uh, finance. It was business history. And I had heard that this guy is just an amazing professor. And so I took this class from him my second year at, uh, at Harvard, and he made this one comment one day in class that has changed, literally probably had one of the biggest impacts on me personally and professionally. And he said, um, quote, the, the, the secret to life is to learn how to celebrate the genius of the and rather than the tyranny of the or, mm-hmm. close quote, right? The secret to life is to learn how to celebrate the genius of the and rather than the tyranny of the or. And, you know, for me, what that meant was, um, you know, personally, I can be successful at work and a great dad. Um, you know, at work, we can, we can achieve our numbers and do it the right way. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's always that conjoint of the end of good that I bring to work. And, you know, I, I have high expectations. I demand a lot from our people. But I'm always like, guys, it's the end. You know, you never do something that's going to sacrifice your integrity, do it the wrong way, you know, um, be aggressive, go, 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 but just do it the right way. It's always the end. And, uh, you, know, you know, so many people say, I can't hit that number. I'm like, no, you can. And you can also innovate, right? It's it's challenging people to find that and. And, you know, when we do, go back to failure and challenging people, it's like, I'm not going to back off the and. Now, we may not always achieve everything, but I'm never going to back off the and. I expect you to do both. I expect you to be, you know, really good at business and at your job and, you know, have a life. A decent human being. A decent yeah, human being. Yeah. So it's just, it's that and. So that was really, really instrumental for me. The, the second thing is um, a, a philosophy to my career that I learned, I learned very early on. And it was when I had left Bain and had joined uh, ACS, which we then sold to Xerox. And uh, over those 10 years, we had, you know, we grew that company to about $6 billion in annual revenue and about 144,000 employees and about 114 companies. And so every, um, I learned early on, like, the secret to my career was go do the hardest thing that my CEO was worried about. Run towards the fire. It's that simple. You know, everyone else is running away from the fire. And like when you run towards the fire, that's where you bring um, order to chaos. And there's no one around to pick up the jewels. And it was just phenomenal for my career. And so I just learned to always run towards the fire. And, and it was great because every year to two years, I get a call on a Sunday night, 11 p.m., from the CEO who says, guess what? I know you've been running company A, B, and C, 
and they're so much better. Uh, I need you to go do company C, D, and E. And I'm like, wait, I'm not finished with A, B, and C yet. He's like, trust me. The, the good that you can do to finish that off versus the good you can do over here. And you're like, okay, my life was going to be crazy for the next six to 12 months. But I, I just always ran towards the fire. And it, uh, you get opportunities so much faster. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you just get access and just the, 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 the bats you have at the plate are just differentially, you know, rewarding earlier in your career than you would otherwise. So, so many people will run towards safe harbors. And in your career, running towards the fire can make a big, big difference. So at the end, you got safe harbors yep. or running away from safe harbors. What's uh, the third? I think the, the, the third one for me is uh, really simple. And it's that, you know, you've all heard it, but uh, hard work beats talent, especially when talent doesn't work. Um, you know, I remember when we first went to Monitor, I was a kid from, you know, I went to public school. And, uh, you know, went to school here at BYU and loved it. And we all go out to monitor and, and you know, they're all Ivy League. And, and I was intimidated. Yeah. Uh, same thing when I went to business school. I was intimidated. I was like, you know, I, I don't know if I can hang with these guys. And then you just learn early on that they're all great people. They have the same insecurities you have. They've worked hard. But if you will just absolutely work harder than everyone else, first in, last out, um, and will just grind, um, that there's no substitute for it. And... Uh, you just got to work hard. Brilliant. I mean, hard work is clear, but hard work takes energy. It does. Where do you get your energy from? Well, you know, I think it's knowing your why. And, uh, you know, for me, it's my family. Um, and so I work hard for my family. And, um, you know, I grew up, my father, um, my father, uh, very humble background. Uh, I, didn't have, I didn't have any siblings that were professionals. And, uh, you know, from a very young age, I've always worked I've always had a job. Um, my dad, I never, you know, for better or for worse, since I was a very young kid, I never assumed that when I got home from school, that was my time. Or I never assumed a Saturday was my time. That, that was never the assumption. It was, Dad, what can I do to help you? And then when the work was done, you know, he would say, go do something else. So I was just raised that way, which is, you know, uh, work, you know, you know, be a cause, go add value. And um, so I just, I was, you know, fortunately I was raised that way. And uh, so I love to work and I've, I've learned how to love to play more, Good. but uh, I think I've always just had a penchant for work. Good. What do you do every day to stay on the top of your game? What kind of rituals, <clears throat> habits do you employ to, to stay, to stay on your A game? Uh, simple. Uh, I have some, you know, I uh, I don't work out enough. I need to work out more. So I, I try to do that in the morning. But uh, the ritual I do every day is um, I try to earn my job every day. So a, a ritual I literally do, mentally do, is when I drive into work, um, I plan out that day. And I and, and there's always 30 things you want to do. But I'm always like, if I don't do these three things, I will have not earned my job this day. And, and when I come home from work, I go through that same mental exercise. And I'm like, did I earn my job this day? My dad taught me years ago, the, the day you assume you have earned your job yeah. is the day you've assured that you've lost your job. So you have to earn your job every day. And I try to keep that mental discipline every day. And, uh, you know, there's days where I'm like, man, I definitely earned my job today. And there's days I'm like, holy cow, I did not. <laughs> <clears throat> but it's just that that discipline has always kind of kept me um, motivated, you know, uh, anxious, uh, focused, and uh you know, it's fortunately, I, I love, I love what I do. It doesn't matter what company it is I'm running. Yeah. I just love, I love, I love growing companies. I love helping companies become better. And I love helping the people that are in those companies, you know, achieve their goals. That's fantastic here. What advice would you give to an aspiring leader at Vivint Solar here? You know, that would be different from what you've already said, because you've identified yeah. some key things that allow you to allow you to be successful. Yeah. Um, other sort of things that you see that people need to work on here, or is the keys pretty much to follow David Bywater? Oh, no, 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 no. I, that's not what I'm saying. Uh, you know, I, I have my own path that's worked for me, but I think everyone's got to find their own their own niche. Um, I think what works for me is great, and I'm sure I could do better. Uh, and I'm sure that people who try to do it my, my way exactly, you know, may not work for them. Um, nor should it, because the world's changing so much. You know, I, I tell you what, uh, the advice I give to our our uh, kind of up-and-comers and our emerging leaders is a few things. One is um, always stay intellectually curious. 
um, I'm, I'm like always just question, right? Question the status quo. And it may be me that put it in place, mm-hmm. question it, right? Or you inherit it, question it. Um, so, you know, definitely just always have that intellectual curiosity and never let that flame go out. In fact, build it. Um, I, I really encourage them to become quantitative as much as they can, right? Um, make sure that they embrace the quantitative side of business. I mean, tell you what, if we had to do it all over again, Brett, I mean, this is a great time to be in business right now. And everything around data analytics, like being a data scientist, I think it would just it's be incredible. Ab- it's incredible, yeah. right? So, you know, our early training at Monitor years ago um, kind of got me hooked on that stuff. But I think just this world today of trying to make, you know, bring insight from chaotic data or the lack of data um, is just a really exciting world. Um, and so, you know, with my kids, I'm like, the more they can do in that space, which is quantitative stuff and always questioning um, it's just an amazing world right now. So that's why I'm really pushing our people to full potential, quantify, question, and just prove that you are improving whatever you're doing. And for us, those are the people we pick. I mean, I'm, I, I don't care if you solve the problem, you know, in, uh, in a certain area, a distant, you know, supply chain. Right. I'll take that athlete any day. You solve the gnarly problem in supply chain. Guess what? I need you now to go solve a problem that's in a radically different function or piece of our business because I just value that they can solve problems and they love solving problems. Um, and those are the ones that just absolutely have meteor, meteoric uh, rises in our company. Very interesting. You talked a lot about athletes and a lot about this concept of treating people like an athlete here. I use the concept in my work of, of going pro, not mm. being an amateur, but being a professional. Mm. And when you look at the athletes that are truly successful that you see in your world, yeah athletes, professionals, yeah. business people. Um, what is the thing that distinguishes somebody who's an amateur from a professional? Oh, that's a really good question, Brett. Um, and I don't want to be cliche in my answers. Um, you know, I think that uh, the people who seem to do really, really well in our business are, are folks that um, still have that blend for uh, respect and protocol, but a healthy... Um, uh, rebel, mm-hmm. you know, it's the, the true rebels that just want to break glass everywhere. Um, you know, some of them can pop out and, and, and survive in that world. But for most of us, it's having that rebellious side in you. Um, but also figuring out how to channel it in the most effective way. And, uh, you know, I just, that that's, that's, that's key for all the guys I see that do really, really well in life. Are you know they're they're rebellious, but at the same time they know how to they know how to work with an organization and move an organization. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's not about just yelling and screaming and breaking down walls. Um, it's about uh, you know having that rebellious side, and then motivating others to say, hey, you you know I I I, I like that energy you have. You've you've challenged us a different way, but they still bring along the organization. Um, you know we have a. Uh, a gentleman right now that I think has done a really good job that way where he's challenged us as a, you know, on some of the things that we are approaching the business. And at first you're like, that's kind of radical thinking. And then the more we thought about it, we're like, that's actually really insightful thinking. And it's changed our organization to be able to gravitate towards some of the ideas that he's had. And, you know, at the same time, he is smart enough to help bring the organization along to make that happen. So um, I think that's, that's, I, I see that trait a lot. And people, once again, they have those other traits. They work hard, right? Um, they absolutely are humble enough where they're earning their job every day. Uh, they don't have that ego or arrogance. Mm-hmm. Uh, hubris, right? I hate hubris. I love confidence. I hate hubris. Um, and so, you know, they have a lot of those, a- those attributes that, uh, you know, and, and they absolutely are okay with failing. Um, but, you know, they, they obviously deliver eight out of ten times. And when they fail, they, 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 they contain the mess, so... Good. You, know, you talk a lot about sort of a balance between confidence and humility, between being risk-taking and, and careful and thoughtful here. Yeah. And, and that's a hard balance for a lot of people to reach. Yeah, a lot of us tend to kind of go to one extreme or another here. What do you use in your own life to bring balance to these, these sort of opposing ideas here in your leadership? Yeah, you know, I, don't, I, I don't have a great answer for that. Um, I, you know, once again, it's, it's just... I. I have worked with some amazing mentors and 
I've just seen how they've got it done. Um, when I was at Xerox, I was the chief CEO for Xerox, and uh, we sold ACS to Xerox. And I got to know Ursula Burns. Mm -hmm. And Ursula Burns was the first black female of a Fortune 500 company in the United States. Um, you know, awesome. Remarkable. Remarkable. You know, just breaking through uh, these ceilings. And, uh, I, you know, I loved working with Ursula. I just, I found that she had this amazing energy and, you know, all these things I've talked about, always challenging status quo and, you know, challenging people and, you know, all those things I think I learned, I watched her do. But she had this great quote that I loved. And she said, impatience is a virtue. Right. Uh, so, you know, many of your listeners will laugh at that, uh, that uh, quote, but it's so true. And what, I, what she meant by that, I think, was uh, if you see something that should get better, you should be extremely impatient to allow that to happen on its own course. Like, go bend light. Go do whatever you need to do um, to make it better. And don't be patient with the status quo. Be impatient. And, uh, you know, I've just, you know, I've seen that in a, a leader who... Uh, was just always, always, always challenging us to be impatient to hit full potential. Um, and but, but at the same time, you know, Ursula, when you talk to her on a personal level, you're like, this lady is uh, just fascinating to be around. She had so many interests. You know, she took care of her health. Uh, she, on a personal level, she really engaged with people. Mm. You know, it was about the person. Relationship. And so you, you saw her be ambitious and impatient and demand great things. But then you also saw the part of her, which was like, you know, I like this person. Um, and, and, you know, I've seen that over and over again in my careers. The best leaders, to me, seem to be able to really, you know, focus on the unit of one, but then inspire the masses. And it wasn't either or. They seem to be able to do both. And, you know, we all know leaders who may have just over-indexed on one or the other. But by and large, by and large, I've seen, you know, the bell curve, right, the 90% of that, that bell curve, of the leaders who really get it done day in and day out and across almost all industries seem to be able to balance both those. I had a conversation with a colleague a few days ago and she said, you know, it seems to me that there are a lot of leaders out there that are not very good and yet they seem to be very successful. And it's easy to point to public figures that have character flaws or weaknesses yeah. and yet seem to be successful here. Um, in your experience here, when you look at true leadership, you've you've implied that most leaders that you've come across that are successful aren't that caricature that we often describe as. They're all flawed, though. We, we're all flawed. Yeah, I mean, I her obs I, I I don't know if her obs her observation is probably correct. I, I just think it's the magnifying glass people put on it. Like, I mean, every leader I know, uh, you know, I I, I see in them and myself they're flaws, right? Mm -hmm. There's just flaws. Uh, so I, I don't think that uh, that's a surprise. Um, I just think that uh, the microscope that gets put on people uh, over amplify uh, flaws, and then people are like, oh, this must be – I mean, they'll take it to the nth degree. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm not surprised that they're flawed because we all, we all have our shortcomings. And, you know, I tell you what, you know, on that topic, I remember one of the greatest uh, – you know, business school was great. You know, our consulting was great. Investment making was great. But I swear, I learned more from watching that show, The Office. <laughs> you remember, remember that show? Absolutely. I remember I would, when I first got my first set of companies to run, I would come home and I'm distressed and I, I'd watch, that's all I'd watch, I'd watch The Office. And I'd be like, I think I did that today, right? I mean, yeah, they're yeah. always making funny of these, funny of these flaws in management. I'm like, I, they must have been watching me today because yeah. I did that today. So, um, you know, uh, that's part of the fun is that you mess up every day. And it's just that the next day, can you just not mess up as much? Or when you're in that situation again, can you uh, do it better? Yeah. And, you know, if you've been doing it for so long, um, you know, you hope that you're getting eight out of 10 right. Indeed. Um, Indeed. Eight out of 10 right. Love that. Love that. Let's talk a little bit about some books, some things you read, some ideas you come across that have been really impressive to you. Are there any sort of books you've read or, or thought leaders you've, you've been uh, sort of inspired by recently? <laughs> Well, you know, I so I, there is a book I just finished, but I, I've been I love reading biographies, and uh, you know uh, I love early days, you know Gandhi. Uh, I love Lincoln. Um, I love Nelson Mandela. Mm -hmm. And a few years ago, I was in Spain and happened before he passed away. I ran bumped into him and met him, which was just amazing to be able to meet a childhood hero of mine. 
Um, so I, I just I've always loved it reading there because they they found a way to do something extraordinary in their lives. Um, where you know early on, if you looked at him, he's like, I'm not betting on them. You know, I, if I'm going to put money on somebody, there's probably nothing about those individuals. You know, in their early years, where you probably said, "Oh, that's a sure bet." Mm -hmm. But you know, I love the fact they had a vision for who they were. They found out what their why was, and they uh, were devoted to it. And so, I think great things happen. But you know, I just finished uh, listening the uh, the book on Steve Jobs, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, biography of him. And uh, you know, you you you. you you know, he's a, he is one of those personalities that was so extreme and just so charismatic. And, uh, you know, these things we're talking about, you know, the fact that he built Apple and then was fired and for 12 years was trying to get back to Apple, right? <laughs> and Next Computer was not a great success. And then obviously uh, Pixar was, but it probably wasn't his passion. Right. Um, but the thing I loved about that and, you know, with him is, you know, you also once again see that uh, you know he had a passion for what he did. But what I loved the most was when he was when he'd gone back to Apple, and he was trying to reintroduce Apple to the world. Mm -hmm. And if you recall, there was that ad that they did in 1987, which was Think Different. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, if you've if you've listened to that recently, I, I just loved how he is talking about the rebels, and it's that the genius is the rebel who thinks they can't change the world. And at the end of the day, you know, that book, I was like, well, you know, Vivint Solar, we're trying to change the world. We're trying to bring green energy at a cost-effective way to get rid of, you know, a lot of the pollution that we have today. And just, you know, I, I love the passion that we have at our company because it's like, how do you think different? How do you grow a company and how do you go change the world? And, you know, out of all the companies I've been associated with, I've never uh, felt like uh, I was changing the world uh, one household at a time. Um, and to have 90% of Americans say they want more solar rather than less, it's like, okay, I'm finally doing something where I have consumer sentiment on my side, Republican, Democrat, independent, Everyone's they're all supportive you. for it. Right. Uh, and you have incumbents that are against you. Um, and, uh, you know, the utilities that are saying, Hey, I like the, I like I, my regulated I like, monopoly. I like, right now. I like my monopoly. Don't, 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 don't mess up, mess up, mess up my cheese here. Um, and so you're, you know, you're really trying to innovate and disrupt that world. And and then you have your kids when you come home at night, and they're cheering you on, yeah. and they're and they're they're literally like you know are you winning or losing, and dad it's too important not to win, and you know and you and you hear your kids talking about that, That's and awesome. and you think about what Steve Jobs you know like think differently change the world, um, you know, when you get those Venn diagrams overlapping enough in your life at a certain part of your careers. You're just grateful for the opportunity, and you and you love doing it. And you've talked, uh, mentioned several times your why, and yeah. it, this is a perfect intersection of things that are both you're passionate about from a business perspective, but also just have inherent value and worth to the uh, so, the society we live in right now. Yeah, so we're doing our best, and I'm in, enjoying the journey. That's great. A um, couple of questions for you, just quick, yes or no, or sort of one way or the other. Sure. Do you lead from the front or lead from the back? Depends. It always depends. I'm about situ I ask that question to my guys all the time. Are you hands on, hands off? And if they say I'm hands on, I'm like, great, you're wrong. If you're hands off, great, you're wrong. It's got to be both. It's situational, right? So it's always about the situation and the individual. And if they're high confidence, high competence, you better be hands off. And if they're low confidence, low competence, you better be hands on. And the trick to bi to business in my is both of you understanding where you are in that two by two being okay with it, mm -hmm. having dialogue about, hey, I need help, and I have no reservations to ask for help, and me saying, great, I would love to help you. And also at the same time, I don't need your help, and pushing back and me saying, that's okay, push back on me. You know, when you, when you really figure out where you are and the situation and the person, and it may be in the same meeting, you may be all over that map. And when you figure out how to do that individually and as an organization, then you can really get things done quickly. So anyways, awesome. The answer awesome. depends. Uh, communication style, um, sort of direct to the point, um, tactful, less direct. Um, I would say uh, I think I'm really good at the individual level. Um, I need to communicate more at a broad level. I always have to have my communication director remind me, hey, we got we to go talk to the masses. Um, and so I, I don't sit back thinking about, hey, how do I put out a grand vision? I'm always in team meetings, you know, unit by unit by unit, really working with folks. So um, I think I, I excel better in those smaller groups and, uh, and working 
to improve on the broader group. Listener versus doer. Uh, I, I used to be a heavy doer, a poor listener. And over the years, I've learned to become a better listener. And I delegate more on doing, but I've learned to listen a lot more over the years. How does that change you as a leader? It helps. You know, it, uh, you just sometimes you realize that uh, listening, you know, as people talk things out, they'll solve their own problems. One. Two, you're always trying to validate what is the true situation. Mm. And so, you know, with my, with my directs, they all know I'm always going to do skip level interviews. I will always build a relationship two or three levels down in the organization. And they've come, they're, they're cool with it. They're cool with the fact that I will go get enough data to validate that what they're saying is true. And, um, and so I just, I try to listen more and I try to have sounding, you know, points throughout the organization. And uh, I'm always pinging people and not, and not in a way to have people feel uh, insecure. It's just the opposite. It's like, hey, I've heard this. That's exactly what I'm hearing. And they're like, great, it's a validation. But, you know, you do it enough, the whole organization says, I better call it straight. <laughs> I better give it to him straight. That's right, because he'll know. He'll know. And that's what you want, right? You, you want just, whether it's good news or bad news, give it to me straight, and I'll give it to you straight. I just want to know where we are, like I said before, and what the plan is to get better. And if, if you have that culture, uh, I think you can make progress a lot faster. Do you find that people, once you do that, are more willing to be straight with you? I think so. I think so. I mean, they, they know who you are and... And, uh, you know, the thing is not, overreact- you know, when they first time they give you bad news, it's that first, <laughs> that first reaction usually sets the tone for everything else. And you should be able to listen and say, okay, well, how can I do it? What can I do to help you? Um, because if that first interaction, you shut them down, it's hard to ever have them come out of that shell again. And that has reverberations for the organization. So you've really got to be okay with bad news, have people feel confident to give you bad news, but always with the plan on how they will actually turn it around. Are you internally or externally motivated? I think I'm very internally. Yeah, I, you know, I've, uh, for me, I'm very driven by achievement uh, and experiences. And uh, it's never really been the accolades or other things that have really motivated me. It's always, I've always had this strong desire to just achieve against a set of goals I set for myself when I was 14 years old. I still have that list. And I still look at it every year. And my new goals for the year are all about advancing that list that I started when I was, you know, and I've added to that list, mm-hmm. obviously. But mm-hmm. it's amazing how my life has been largely driven by a list I put together when I was 14 years old. We got to talk about measure. this here. So yeah. what motivated you at 14 to come up with the list? I, I met this guy named John Goddard, mm-hmm. who, which was a, a modern day explorer of the world, you know. And he met me, he came to my school, junior high. Mm. And I met this guy, and I thought, man, that'd be the perfect job. I was just <laughs> born 200 years too late or 300 oh, years too late, yeah. right? But uh, he said he had this list that he mm. wanted to accomplish in life. And, you know, when you're 14, you kind of have a narrow view on life. But it had things like for me, which was learn you know, so many languages. Or I wanted to go to 50 countries. Um, you know, I wanted to go to an Ivy League school. You know, these are things that there's no reason why I would want. I grew up in a small little farming community of 5,000 people. And I met this guy, and he's like, think big. And I was like, think big. What does that, what does that mean, right? And so one day I sat down and I wrote this list. And I thought, okay, well, this is me thinking big. For, you know, it may be small for some people or it may be huge for other people, but it was the first time I really said, okay, what is this horizon I should have in my life? And what are things I want to accomplish? And uh, so it's just funny. You know, I go back to that list, and, you know, most of the list is checked off now, and I've obviously added new things to it. But I'm very internally driven against the list that I have that I said, when my life's over, I want to have done these things, experienced these things, learned from these things. And, uh, and it's, you know, it's been a good beacon for me so far. Fantastic. Well, David, thank you very much for sharing a little bit about your style, your approach, and the work you're doing at Vivint Solar. Appreciate it, Brett. How can people stay in touch with you? Uh, you on social media? I, I think I am. I think I'm on Facebook. That's pretty much it. <laughs> All right. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'd love to keep in contact with people. Um, and it's always easy. I'm just at David H. Bywater at yahoo.com. I'd love to hear from people. And they can find me on Facebook or they can just give me a call at Vivint Solar. Fantastic. David, thanks for your time today. Thanks, Brett.